Who's here? How you doing? We uh, are doing the DA's budget first, and if you'll recall from the December uh, budget meeting, um, we had in the DA's budget increased uh, the funding for the DA to be able to add back a deputy district attorney. Um, from the adopted budget of 1415 to the recommended budget of 1516, uh, there's three additional FTE. One of those is in our revised budget in the current year. It was a grant position for victims assistance. So that's already added. Um, the other two, one was the deputy district attorney that we increased the general fund budget target for. And the other one is a grant for a legal assistant one. Uh, and so the DA met the budget target based on the additional general fund and added the DA position. The other two are grant funded. Um, as I said, she did meet her budget target overall. I'll let her talk about some of the uh, intricacies of the programs in her budget real quick. But I did want to let you know also, which isn't, won't be reflected in the DA's budget, it'll be reflected in the capital budget, but we are moving forward with design of the, uh, the new facility for the district attorney. So, um, and I, I assume we're probably we may get into the building next fiscal year, assuming we move forward with it, uh, probably about an 18-month period, roughly or so, um, from now. We did not put, which is typical, um, any funding in the DA's budget for um, furnishings in the facility, but we did because we have existing furnishings that will move over. Some of the stuff that we have that's existing, just to put it bluntly, is junk. Um, so we'll want to see that go. But we did, from all of the consolidation of the Health and Human Services facilities, earmark the nicer furniture for the DA's office that was replaced by the modular furniture that went into the new facility. So we have some nicer stuff that we'll be able to utilize. And then as we get ready to move in, we'll have to kind of see what we what we need based on, uh, based on what we don't have, if, if there is something. So... Uh, I would, I would assume there's money to take care of that. If you need to I would oh. think if you're going to build a building and move in it, you're going to put the attic with furnishings in it. Right. Make it useful. Yeah, we'll, we'll carry a fund balance, which the Board of Commissioners or Budget Committee, depending on how much we're talking, can decide if they want to spend some of that fund balance on furnishings. But we're going to try to make it work with, work with what we had over oh, yeah. That's good. Yeah, definitely. As long as the stuff that we have is going to meet the needs. I know a lot of times I've seen a lot of those conversions and what's intended to work and then what reality when you start moving it in and looking at it and realize, fuck, what you was know, I thinking cabinets, at the moment? conference tables, all those things that we have are after and we can move on to new spots. Okay, so you want to kind of summarize anything else that I may have missed or what you want to add? Um, the criminal division. So in the criminal division, we are adding um, back hopefully the that deputy DA position, which was cut uh, two years ago now. And so we had quit doing some types of cases in our office, um, some drug cases that we no longer filed because we just didn't have enough people to handle all the work. So we'll take those back as of July one when we get that new position or that position restored, basically back. And then the legal assistant position that we're adding back in as well um, partly has to do with how much evidence police officers are generating by all of the technology that we have. So all of the patrol cars have maps in them, um, the, the videos running. So if you have three patrol cars who arrive on the scene of an incident, we need to get copies of all three of the maps. And now officers are going to start wearing body cameras, and so that is going to be a big increase in how much discovery we have. And we have to get our discovery out in a very quick manner or the court and everybody else is upset with us. So, so that's in the criminal division. Is there any extra server space? Is there going to be any increase that way to be able to house all this information? The data management system that we bought stores, um, it, it has been storing most of it. And so that it, we haven't needed to expand on that. And the police agencies are storing it as well, and so that's not our issue. We just have to be able to pull it down, make a copy of it, and give it to the defense. So, 
is there a time period in which the storage starts just stacking up? I mean, do we, do we start expunging stuff after seven years? What's the? It's not our evidence. It's just part of the case that we have to right. provide discovery for. Okay. It's maintained by the agencies that create the so video. So the sheriff's office issue. Right. Well, it, mostly she's issue. talking about Medford Police that's oh, going okay. to the body cameras right now, and they'll they'll have their own server for storing that data. Oh, they will have to take staff time to convert it, to provide it in a format that can be used for discovery, uh, which will be expensive. Of, right, and to be able to look at it ourselves and be able to provide it to the defense. Okay. My, my, assumption, my apologies for making the assumption that when you said we, I was thinking our... Yeah, uh, and um, we already have an evidence retention schedule that we have that we've worked on for years, and so we do keep evidence not varying degrees of time, but it's the police department's de uh, responsibility to store it rather than ours. And then in the other two divisions doing really well, the child support division, we uh, gained a lot of cases because uh, child support and um, family support in our for our uh, office, we handle people who don't get public assistance and the state handles people who get uh, public assistance. And there was a change statewide where they transferred additional cases to us that we probably should have had for a number of years, but for whatever reason, the state hang on to them. And so that was about a 30% increase in cases. Um, but because of, we've been having a decline, that was actually a good timing for the office to, um, and they don't believe they're going to need additional staff or anything to deal with the, that increase. And then in victim services, we did get the grant position for um, a victim advocate to work solely with people who are uh, victims of juvenile offenders, and we've never had had that before. So that's um, offering a lot more service to those um, individuals who are victims of a juvenile offender. So we do have, just for the commissioners that are new, and, and to remind the people that have been on the budget committee, we have a budget policy that says we won't backfill or replace the loss of state or federal revenue, um, generally speaking. And so when we have grant positions that we accept grant funding for, when those grants go away, the positions go away. And the DA's office is in the similar cycle of those things occurring. Um, the key in terms of the budget committee, those funding streams for the grants are dedicated. They have to be used for that purpose if we receive them. The key for the budget committee in this case is the general fund budget target that we set um, in terms of an ongoing operating expense that we're committing to, uh, which can also be uncommitted at some point in the future if the budget committee chose to or it was necessitated to do so. Um, and as I said, Beth did come in on our budget target. What is that amount? Um, yeah, it's what I handed you guys. I, you probably you may not have brought this with you. Um, uh, four million seventy thousand one hundred and forty four dollars okay. and essentially the um, the district's attorney's office is pretty much fully funded by general fund I mean, there's some grants and uh, some fees but it's very minimal and it is listed to uh, on uh, calling with each budget is the spreadsheet of revenues and expenditures, and at the end it shows revenues to expenditures. The difference between revenues and expenditures is the amount of the general fund budget contribution, oh, okay. which in this key case would be the amount of the target since I said she's on the target. So you can go down each, as I just said, the district attorney's office is mostly funded by general fund. We don't show a general fund revenue. The general fund revenue is the difference between revenues and expenditures. Mm -hmm. But you can see that you know, there's a, a small, the minimum marginal amount of revenue that comes from fees uh, and grants. So when we say we fund most of our general fund that the county receives goes toward public safety, it's about 70% when you include all departments and mm -hmm. the DA's office is one that's uh, mostly comprised of general fund. We don't charge anybody when we handle cases for victims <laughs> every day. So. Even though it's not in your budget, it will be in the capital budget. It's related to the DA's office. Why don't you talk a little bit about the process so they're aware of what you've gone through for the uh, new facility? Uh, we went with the architect uh, quite a few times. He's walked through our buildings. He drafted up um, some plans. Our building is used for grand jury as well as the criminal division, the victim services division, and the um, family 
fourth division. And so we kind of, because of the three buildings that we're currently in, were never designed for us. We just made them work and kind of fit in it as it went. Um, so it's been great to work with him to really look at like how much space do we really need and you know, we don't need, um, like we don't currently have really a break room, but we have four kitchens. It's just the way the buildings were made. <laughs> so, um, so fixing those kinds of things has worked well and then um, making uniform sizes for all of the attorney's offices because that's another issue in our office whenever someone leaves. People started kind of jockeying for that office, and then we had five office changes. So now they're all going to be uniform, um, except for my office and the chief's office. Everyone else's office is exactly the same size. So, so working with them has been really good just to try to figure out like what is the best um, spaces. I know they looked at some other models even around the country. And then the safety issue has really been our number one thing. So figuring out how to design the building, still have a, have a friendly appearance to the public, have a lot of safety features built into it to where um, the general public can't just get into our building and also could drive up to it, and drive through it, set up a bomb, all those kinds <laughs> of things. I was, was going to say, how are you going to bomb proof it? You can't quite do that, but you can make it as best as you can. It definitely um, included a lot of features so that someone couldn't drive a car into it, which is an issue that we consider and think about looking at our buildings now. So. I'll say the next argument will be over the office still because of the different view out of the office. Right? Oh. Well, the criminal division is on the second floor, <laughs> yeah, which right. is also good for safety reasons. Um, and so, like, the offices go all around the outside edge. So, where is this property? It's going to be um, hopefully built in the lot right next to us. So, there's a public parking lot next to us that belongs to the county that was required to be put in when. The juvenile building was built, but not very many people know about it, and no one hardly ever uses it. And so actually by us building in that and then eventually making our buildings leveled in parking lot it will be much more usable to people because they'll see it, and, and whereas currently they don't realize that there's a public parking lot just beyond our buildings. If you drive by there pretty much on any given day, there's maybe one vehicle parked in a day. Yeah. Uh, it looks like there's at least 80 parking. I remember how many parking spots there are there. 65 wow. parking yeah. spots. On, it's on never grand jury days, we use seven of them, but that's usually the only wow. people that are ever wow. parked there. It's because we ask the grand jurors to please. You know, there was a place, place like that. that. It, really? yeah. <laughs> <Anywhere. laughs> it was a requirement by the city when we built the juvenile center that is, you know, basically a block plus away mm -hmm. that we built that parking out there. So it was really meant to be used by the juvenile facility. And typically, what happens is they park over where the state courts are or in the juvenile parking lot that's still in, I guess that'd be the north. Um, so yeah, it's good. We own the property. We don't have to buy property. Um, we will probably, I'm sure the city will make us reclaim where the buildings are now for parking. For, <coughs> for both facilities will be much more uh, usable, I'm sure. As well as in the plan art, we have a secure parking area for employees, so that would be good as well. Um, but I think it'll be used a lot more when it's flip-flopped around, people will see that there is a parking spot there for them. Any questions from anybody? <clears throat> I always have trouble with the district attorney's office judging whether there's enough or not enough attorneys or not enough people involved because your case is fluctuates, you have turnover, and you have a lot of things. And uh, it's a judgment question on your part. How do you feel? Do you feel you're, I'm not sure you how to ask the question accurately, on top of your caseload? Uh, are, are we gaining ground, losing ground? And, and you know, maybe just talk a little bit about that. Are, where are we at on that kind of spectrum, in your opinion, mm -hmm. in judging the call? Mm -hmm. um, I think we are gaining ground by adding the attorney back. Um, I don't know that we would, we've always been used to high caseloads, so that's the other thing. I mean, this is the only county I've ever worked in, and so for 26 years I've worked here and we've always had high caseloads. So we're somewhat used to that and have a method and a process down for that. But as the, um, as cases increase and as police agencies add officers, that puts in more cases into our office. And then when we finally got to the point where we couldn't take everything, you know, that was kind of the breaking point, I think, for us. But. But I, so I believe that this will reduce the caseloads, but not by very much. It's still, they still will have high caseloads as compared to around the state. 
Do you consider our, the limited jail space we have and the caseloads, and you made the comment that there's an increase in cases because people had officers and so mm -hmm. forth. Then you get into, is there a prioritizing of where we say, you know, we just, there's a limit to how much we can handle in the county. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're, we're going to start limiting or not prosecuting certain cases. I mean, is this how you yeah, we look are. at it? I mean, we use our discretion to not file some cases that we just think are too de minimis, they're just not worth the time and effort that it's going to take um, to handle that case. And then some cases we've pushed back onto the cities. So if the city code covers conduct, like Medford Police covers disorderly conduct, for example, mm -hmm. so we won't take those cases from Medford officers. Medford has to file that. But we'll still take that case from Eagle Point because they don't have a city code that covers it. So, that we've done that as well to push the low level kind of crimes back into the cities where they probably do a better job of actually, you know, handling them and hearing from their citizens about a case that isn't really worth jail time or those resources that we have. A lot of the cases that get referred don't don't necessarily require jail time. Yeah. The the jail is I mean, the jail's overcrowded, but you know, it's been years since I actually looked at the numbers, but I bet if you include you know, parole board warrants in our county, local supervisory authority warrants, municipal warrants, and state court warrants were up over 10,000. We couldn't been build 10,000 jail beds, you know, to house everybody that just has a warrant out for them, much less people that would get sentenced. No, I mean, well, that gives you to, uh, it's hard, that's why I say it's hard for a person like myself, and I'm sure other members, to judge either how efficient you are or is it every other year we're going to have to add somebody because it keeps growing? Or is there a better, is there a way to help you hire a consulting firm to manage the caseload so we don't have to spend so much? Or, you know, right. We've done a lot too. Why trying to some of these things that aren't going anywhere? Mm -hmm. Well, some of it builds your criminal history. So then when someone commits a more serious crime, if it's your first um, offense and we haven't really passed on prosecuting for two or three other offenses, it changes your criminal history, which changes your what you could be looking at, um, you know, in a given uh, situation. And we've also tried to tap into the law schools and get interns down here who might come and work and get do it for school credit. So we're working on trying to do that. We could give them some of the low-level kind of offenses, and it um, would be at no cost to to the county. They're doing it for school credit, or they're getting. There's a program through the Oregon State Bar trying to get new law students some experience, and so we signed up for that. So we may get some interest. Uh, that also helps in those ways to try to get additional cases. But on your on a lot of more serious cases as well, um, we currently have um, I think six pending homicide cases, and it take us a little over a year to typically resolve, um, a year to two years to resolve. Well, I don't have like my more senior attorneys who can handle that type of a case, I don't have enough senior attorneys that I can give one to each one. So like I have two, for example, and if we have any other ones, we're going to start having to double up if, if we can't get some of these other older ones resolved. And so those take a lot of time on the attorney's parts as well, you know, the more serious crimes. When you look so at... We try, to, we try to balance, you know, how we're going to be spending our time and what we're what kind of cases we're looking at. We prosecute a lot of driving under the influence cases, and I think those are some of the most serious cases because that is probably the largest danger to all of us is that we would get hit, one of our, our family members would get hit by a drunk driver. So we handle an awful lot of those cases with our misdemeanor deputies. Um, so it's hard to pick and choose what cases are ones that aren't worth our time and effort, and we've tried to do that um, by putting some of them back onto the city. Yeah, when you look at the comparables, you know, Mark used to bring in the comparables, Beth continued that kind of practice at the time of the budget hearing. Hearings occur, you'll you'll see that we've actually made ground in terms of cases per DA uh, and the, the, the cases we'll accept to prosecute as compared to other counties, but that's because other counties cut way more significantly than we did. We cut one position, I think Lane County cut like seven or eight if I remember correctly. You know, Josephine County obviously has cut a lot. They're not typically one of our comparables, but if you use Lane County, you know, if, you, if, if we had to do this, this similar cut, we would have lost probably two or three attorneys as opposed to one over that whole time period. So mm -hmm. we're, we still have a high caseload, but comparably speaking, when you ask about comparables, we actually are, are doing pretty well. 
The other thing is, and I think you know, Beth should be complimented for this. Her and I talked about this. It's been a while, maybe nine months ago, but she agreed to and asked for a uh, audit, workflow audit for her staff. So you talked about a consulting mm -hmm. company. We have internal audit doing a performance audit in workflow for her staff. <coughs> to see if we can get some more efficiencies and make sure that people are, you know, um, uh, being held to the same standard in terms of the work uh, uh, amount and flow. Uh, efficiency in, in uh, getting done, getting the work done. So, and the other thing is, and Beth didn't talk about this, but you know, the, there are state laws that require early disposition programs, and a lot of, I mean, a lot of it happens through plea, uh, plea bargains. But you know, they they do participate in that. They do report. I don't know if you saw the report. You saw the report. The early disposition programs. Uh, there was a couple of years where the state. Criminal Justice Commission required reporting from the counties on early disposition programs. It, it, it happened through the Public Safety Coordinating Council, actually. Um, but we do use early disposition programs. In other words, resolving cases prior to going to court and trial and those types of things. So there are things that are helping mitigate the influx of cases. Uh, the, the, the reason why I recommended adding this position Beth and I have talked about it quite a bit, but also we've talked about it with the PS Public Safety Coordinating Council. They made a recommendation that the board support that. Commissioner Breidenthal was there when that occurred. Um, the addition of the position was because Beth did get to the point where she had to stop prosecuting certain types of cases. So we weren't doing that before we lost this position. We were prosecuting pretty much everything. Now some may be prosecuted by turning them back to the cities. Some may be prosecuted by early disposition rather than going to court and trial and that kind of stuff. But, so this this will put us back on track, we think, mm -hmm. with being able to prosecute all cases, or the cases that they reasonably believe should be prosecuted, I guess I should say. Yeah. Well, you can see where we're coming from. I mean, you can add more attorneys and, and probably take on more cases, but do we want to? Right. And, uh, or, or do you just say, you know, District Attorney's office is big enough. This is it. It's all the money we want to spend on prosecution. And somehow the, you, you pick the ones that should be prosecuted, and the rest of it, I guess they said the old saying falls through the cracks. It doesn't get prosecuted, or it gets mediated, or it goes to some other effort. Right. Well, I mean, it's, I, it's more of an efficiency. Uh, Thing that's going through my mind. If I, I always like to get into productivity and efficiency and stuff like that. And I've always wondered how in the heck do you, how do you control something like that? Right. And part of it's about accountability too. Right? So, you know, when people do commit crimes, should they be held accountable, or should we just say, oh, we don't do anything about that in this county? And we haven't been to that point until we lost that last position. In the planning of the new building. Um, you know, I don't. I honestly don't foresee us coming and asking for another attorney position unless a, a big caseload was to change or some, something else was to change for a number of years. I just don't think that that's. I mean, we do see some growth, but I don't see that it's going to be really jumping up or something. And as our population grows, eventually, yes, we would have to grow to keep up with the population. Does the law allow the prosecutor to contract out cases? No. Not that I'm aware of. I never looked into that. To contract I mean, out. I mean, a lot of places you contract. You've you got a certain amount of attorneys. Right. I don't know who it would contract, contract with. Contract out with private people to handle a certain amount of things. Well, well, I'm not aware of anyone so in Oregon. So it's sort of that, unique. Uh, if we do that at the university, if the caseload gets to be, I mean, obviously we're not prosecuting, but you know, if our attorneys are overwhelmed and we go out to third party um, firms, um, the, the rate that we pay is three and four times the rate that our in-house attorney is paid. So uh, it's not, in my mind, it's it's, it's your last case scenario is, is to, to outsource in that way. I, I don't know what your thoughts are. Yeah. And I, 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 I don't know who you would outsource with. The legalities <laughs> yeah. of Whether you could. I yeah. mean, you right. know, you yeah. take an oath to <clears throat> handle the cases as the state of Oregon. So I mean, I'd have to deputize somebody. They fall wasn't. under the authority of the district attorney, and it would be awfully uncomfortable for the district attorney to be deputizing county. someone. I would just think that people have agreed there's more attorneys and jobs. 
Yeah. yeah. I thought somebody. I mean, we did deputize. Somebody might start working cheaper or something. Yeah. <laughs> we do deputize um, like those law students that come, but they work under our supervision. Yeah. yeah. So we do do that, and that is allowed. The attorney general's office can come in and handle cases um, that if we request of them to handle cases. We don't need that resource because we are large enough to handle our own cases. That's probably. <laughs> but, well, you, you covered one of the portions I was going to ask you, and that's on the interns that you were talking about. There are mm -hmm. two parts. So one of them, you obviously prosecute on behalf of the state, not the county. Right. So that means that you're, uh, uh, you said you'd have to deputize those interns to go ahead and prosecute those cases. So thanks for clarifying that. I was mm -hmm. unsure on how that would work. Mm -hmm. And then the, uh, the second half of that is I know we've discussed about interns throughout other portions of the county function to go to supplement the workforce. And it seemed to be a, a question on uh, management having, having to add some type of oversight to make sure those interns are doing that. Does, this, do you, does your budget reflect the ability to have oversight over those interns? Are we going to be looking at a quarter FTE in the future to cover that? No. Or you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. we, do, um, we do assign an attorney to supervise them um, and uh, under the Oregon State Bar rules and the Supreme Court rules to allow them to practice, they have to have an attorney who supervises them. And so we do put them through a training program and we supervise them, but we currently are doing that. So it's not anything additional. They're, they're not really standing up in court. I mean, you may be envisioning that they're standing up in court prosecuting cases. Most of them are doing what clerks do yeah. and a lot of the record stuff. And they're also, they are doing some prosecution in terms of negotiating, you know, yeah. contact or, and defense and negotiating. And please. we do have them handle like arraignment. So they do a court almost every you day. might be on a trial. Yeah, I, I would assume they'd be the very low level of right. work. And we and supervise them. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was curious just on the management up. of those employees if that was if you already had that in consideration. I think they mostly just probably reason. fight over getting an intern. Attorneys versus on. <laughs> <time> <laughs> 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 honestly. Just, just it does free up the attorney's time a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So but it does take effort to supervise them. It does. Yeah. 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 Okay. We're going to move on. Thanks. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank Your you. job was really easy today, wasn't it? You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 look pretty. Thank you. Thank you. She, she's the magic behind the, the actual binder, though, right? She is. <laughs> she did it all. Just two of you? Yeah. Yeah. Kevin, how are you doing? Are you in the yeah. chair? Yeah. 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 Oh. Hi, how are you? That's great. Hi, how are you? Hi. Do you uh, want to just introduce yourself to everybody? I don't know if you've met everybody here, Corey. I think I've met everybody here. My name is Corey Falls. Oh, sorry. It's Sue Watkins, finance person. <laughs> So I'm going to take a few minutes just to explain this since Corey's new and everybody um, here has been participating in this for a while. But these are essentially just my office's review of the budget that's submitted. Okay. Um, I do it a little differently than probably most city managers or county managers where you go and meet with them in your office. I actually make it a public meeting and invite the budget committee to show up. Okay. They don't make any decisions on your budget. They may ask some questions, but they wouldn't deliberate towards a decision yet okay. because really it is just kind of a budget review. Typically, um, we may make some changes after this, but usually it's just making some clarifications and that type of stuff. Okay. So uh, what I want to, and I'll kind of speak to everybody while I'm, while I'm talking to you, but the sheriff's uh, office did come in on their budget target. They're about $864 under on their general fund budget target, but they put that into emergency management. Uh, just in case you were going to ask, their budget target in the sheriff's office was $21,200,233 and in emergency management $143,496. That's the general fund budget target. Um, and let me just say, uh, 
the total budget came in a little, look at the back, $316,000 increase in the total budget, which is commendable, just right off the top, I'll tell you that. Um, the uh, major impacts to their budget that I saw going through it was a change in contract services, reductions in contract services throughout programs, uh, a significant increase in employee health care costs by program, uh, probably between all programs, four to $500,000. So if you look at the total budget increasing 300000 in fact, they came in, came in on their budget target with that amount of increase in uh, employee, and when I say employee, I'm specifically meaning the union, JCSEA's insurance costs. You all know the manager's cost was uh, capped at 7%, so, um, but, but for, probably about four, around 400,000 roughly increase in costs. So that, just that alone is more than what their overall budget increase for. That should tell you that they made decreases throughout the budget in other places. There are no increase, well, there's a 0.45 increase in FTE over what was adopted. Um, last year, but it's a reduction in what was revised. So we were at about 170 FTE revised. Uh, that's because we added in the current fiscal year several positions that were not funded. We just added the FTE and the prior sheriff was going to fund them out of their existing budget. Um, and of course we've had a change. So this is a transitional budget. I expect that we'll see some changes just through different management styles uh, and uh, structure. I'm going to ask the sheriff to talk a little bit about the structuring as we go through each of the programs so he can kind of bring you up, up to speed about what he's doing there. Um, a couple of things I just wanted to address with you guys. Uh, in the um, pros, for significant issues ahead on page two, in administration. This is something, the, the first sentence is something that I've asked about in the past, where the Sheriff's Office continues to seek ways to provide more services with fewer resources. We haven't had fewer resources. We've increased your budget every year that I've been here. So I don't want to represent to the public that we have fewer resources. We might have more costs, but we have continued to increase the budget over time. So I'm hoping you guys can make an adjustment for that. Yes, we can. Um, and then I caught, this is maybe just a, just a question on that, yeah. is, is that, um, you said we, you've increased our cost, we've increased our cost. We've increased your budget. We've, your, your budget has grown every year. You haven't had fewer resources. You've had more resources. Maybe just not enough for the increase in cost. Right. So we've had more money, but not necessarily more FTEs. Um, well, you've had more FTEs as well. I mean, you've added FTEs over the years for sure. We increased the FTEs over the last Yeah, yeah. I, but, but really, just philosophically, I, I'm just not wanting to represent the public. That represents essentially your budget's been going down, or that you've had less money in your budget than you have, and your budget's grown every year. I think what's happened is the costs in your budget have grown quicker than the revenues to your budget. Okay. So, um, but, so yeah, you got a little bit fewer FTEs showing in this program, but overall, so. no, that's what I wanted to clarify: is the the FTEs, if, if those were, if you were considering those as the resources, but we're we're essentially talking about the, the increase. We're in talking the about the, yeah, the right. Um, and then kind of flipping through, I'm gonna. What I'm going to do is go through each of the programs that you have listed, and then we'll go through the numbers because okay. I, I have a lot of questions on the numbers. Um, under corrections, I just caught this and I wanted to check with you all. Where you now, you say the jail kind of, it's on page five, I think. You have the same page five. Significant issues in the year ahead. You say that you have 294 prisoners now. And one of the things that just caught my attention on this is uh, with ORS 169 044. Um, and what that does is the Board of Commissioners sets it, I'm telling this for everyone else, you probably know, it sets a capacity for the jail, lim a, a limit for jail capacity. I don't think we've updated that since we've added the jail beds. Oh. In other words, you're actually getting an emergency overcrowding situation at 60 bids less. It does require you to consult with the district attorney and local law enforcement about setting the cap and then bring a recommendation for the board to pass an order because they actually have to pass an order setting right. the cap. 
it does require you to have a process in place for um, making releases, and you do, I see, saying that you're using your release assessment mm -hmm. tool, but uh, we may want to adopt that as part of the order. Um, and I know that's not typically just necessarily a budget issue, but it's just something I thought when I was going through. Okay. I did see that you reduced uh, the FT and your corrections budget as well as your um, administration budget, and then increase the FT in your criminal budget. Uh, and I'll talk more about that when we get into the numbers because I'd like the budget committee to have a little explanation uh, as to what that is. Uh, in criminal service, I did see, uh, and the sheriff did talk to me, I'm assuming this is associated with special uh, victims unit created to address sexual assault and child abuse. This is the program that you're taking from Ashland? Uh, no, but it's gonna fall under that umbrella. Yeah, that, yes. And you, so, and you don't have additional resources for that. You're doing it within your existing resources, just moving things around. Yeah, well, the only thing we're adding is, is a advocate from Community Works. It's not an FT, but we'll contract with them. Okay. So, <clears throat> which we'll go into that. And essentially, what we're doing is, right now we have a, we have a sergeant that doesn't oversee anybody and works on the High Tech Crimes Task Force. That position is going to supervise this unit. <coughs> so we're having to supervise, supervise people in the, that task force will fall underneath that umbrella. The program with Ashton will fall underneath that umbrella. The advocate will. Okay. So, but it's the same same resources we have in house. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I'll have you know, kind of just so you all know as we go through these, I, they do break down what percentage of the program is funded by general fund. So, while we said there's 21 plus million. I'm going to back up just a little bit. The administration is 99.89% funded by general fund. The uh, corrections division is 59%, 59.85% funded by general fund. And the rest comes from um, contracts with state and federal agencies. A, a significant portion of the jail budget comes from a transfer in funds from community justice from the Community Corrections Act. It's about $1.7 million uh, that goes to the jail budget. And so we actually receive funding from the state because we supervise those offenders locally that are sentenced to a year or less. That includes the time they're incarcerated, but also alternative programs like the Transition Center or House Arrest or Work Crews or Drug Treatment or any of those types of things. But this is a, an example of where the sheriff's budget and the community justice budget um, you know, have to work together for services in, in uh, um, We also have in the corrections budget contracts for uh, with federal agencies for, for beds. This was something that we talked about when the budget committee and board agreed to fund the expansion of the jail, saying that we would use some of those beds to uh, earn revenue from contract services so that we could fund the cost of having the additional beds partially and so um, we previously had generated up to about 1.2 million dollars a year in revenue from those contracts is that what you anticipated yeah I, I well I told the board I think about a million a year mm -hmm. um, we're not limited to that mm -hmm. I think we we, we had a well, why they weren't obligated to it, we had an, you know, and then we didn't have a, a contractual agreement. We had a contractual agreement to use bed space with an indication that they would use about 23 beds at any given time. But we could expand that if they're willing, you know, if, they're, if the federal government, and there are multiple different federal agencies that, that can be involved. So you can have U.S. Marshals, you can have immigration, you can have federal parole. They're all different federal agencies with different contractual agreements. This is mostly related to the U.S. Marshals and, and immigration holds that aren't local holds. If there's a local hold, then we're paying the cost. If the local holds drop, immigration pays the cost or we release them. So we don't continue to hold them for immigration when we have no local charges. Uh, okay, I'm going to move on past uh, In the criminal division, so if you drop two staff from administration and two staff from corrections, but added five in, in criminal. That was part of the reorganization from admin and then um, from lieutenants to sergeants. 
and then allocating personnel where they have been working. Okay, so it was a reallocation as well. Right. Okay, so that you all know, uh, and you can <coughs> tell me if I'm wrong here, uh, Sheriff. I'm sorry. We had we cut four, or the sheriff had cut four lieutenant positions in this budget. Um, he had decided to restructure to have, not have lieutenants and instead have a captain structure with separation between the captain and two sergeants. He did that within the FTE allocation and it likely did save him some money because he has less captains than he had lieutenants and moved the rest into sergeants with their, which are less expensive than lieutenants. So if you want to you explain the kind of umbrella structure to them by division maybe. Yeah, so we... <clears throat> Just to explain the existing structure was uh, the sheriff had two captains that oversaw the support and operations division, and then underneath those two captains were four lieutenants. Uh, in an ideal world, those four lieutenants would have been supervising uh, a section of the organization, and that, that wasn't happening. So when I came in and, and looked at the organization, I figured we'd restructure. There's, there's pretty much three equal size the way I see it, divisions within our organization. One is corrections, one is our operations, which includes all patrol and field services, and one is our investigations or support services that include investigations, the detectives, civil. So what I did with those three uh, divisions, I, I decided to have a captain oversee those three, those three divisions and eliminate the lieutenant's uh, position, which that we went from eliminating, we stayed the same amount of FTE, so with those four lieutenants position, one became a captain, one was slated for an undershare position, and two, two uh, were slated as uh, sergeant positions where we could add an administrative sergeant and an extra jail sergeant because right now we only have three supervisors, uh, shift supervisors in the jail, and I wanted four. I wanted to have one for every shift because I felt that was important. That's our highest liability area and I wanted full coverage there. So that's what we did with that. The only thing that I don't want you guys to get misled on, because it did save money because we eliminated those, however, adding two sergeant's positions also has the opportunity to generate overtime, as you know. So so there, good, there can be some, some money that comes from those sergeant's positions because of the overtime that they can incur. Except for we, we have a policy that allowed overtime for lieutenants as well. True. So, so we, I don't think I think that it's not going to be a big deal. Yeah, and it's just not. one point that he missed. that's important is that the previous structure had two pre-existing captains, so he didn't add three new captains. Right, right. He took four lieutenants <coughs> and made it into one captain with the two that existed, and that's his overarching kind of divisional structure. And then took the other ones and made them into you know, sergeants essentially. He did earmark one for an under sheriff, which he may or may not hire in this budget cycle. Uh, but it is your market. It's within the budget target and within his existing budget. It's not with additional funds. So, and you know, the Constitution essentially allows the sheriff to uh, uh, constitute his uh, key administrative positions as he sees fit. I mean, he's, he's actually able to just appoint them if, he, if that's what he wants to do. He's, uh, sheriff Falls has chosen not to do that. He's actually went through a competitive hiring process uh, for these positions. So that's also commendable in my opinion. Uh, yeah. yeah. On the oh. sheriff position, in the um, sergeant positions, typically when you add more into a specific area, it reduces some workload, so it reduces the need for overtime. Do you see that happening as within the sergeant pool by adding those two FTEs into that pool? I hope so because one of the sergeants is going to be my special victim sergeant, and I and, and with that, uh, I see that as a quasi working sergeant to where they're going to be not only supervising but able to take some cases also so I think that will impact the the investigative cases that we, we take in investigations uh, in terms of our administrative sergeant uh, I don't know if that will increase workflow within the patrol within the operator ranks but uh, I think it will alleviate some some work within our admin structure and, and let me say that as I just noted we have lieutenants that qualify for overtime yeah so the budget doesn't reflect, it may reflect operationally a reduction in overtime for people because you have additional people, but the budget doesn't reflect a cost reduction in overtime because now it's just being spread differently, if it is there. And, you know, we'll have to wait and see how, how what happens with the budget with that. But, uh, and I'm talking overall, not just with regard to the one specific uh, 
the, uh, uh, the special victim. What's it called? What do you call it? I'm sorry. Just the, it's a detective sergeant. The special, the special victim. Yeah. It's, it's a special it's a detective sergeant. Okay, I want to move on to law enforcement district. So I just wanted to clarify in your summation that you submit, uh, where you talk about changes, mm -hmm. you have proposed that there was going to be an additional deputy added yes. to the law enforcement district, but then your budget doesn't reflect that. Our current currently we have seven, <coughs> and so we're asking for one additional one. And I see it seven point eight one. Well, that's actually 2013. The current budget, you have eight. Yes. And you've requested eight, so you didn't add one. And the reason why I'm asking you that is because... Yeah, we noticed that when I got this from Monday. Yeah, the reason why I'm asking is, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at operating revenues to expenditures, you're spending them all. You have a fund balance, but you have a fund balance because when we ended urban renewal, everyone who was not... who's tax rate was frozen and wasn't participating in the game, got a one-time lump sum, mm -hmm. and that included the lighting right? district. So you have you have a, a fund balance that may lead you to believe that you can afford to add a position, but you yes. don't have the you don't have the operating revenue to support that over time. In other words, if you add a position, okay. we're going to be cutting it pretty quickly. And so everyone knows here, mm -hmm. we adopt a budget for the White City Lighting District that is proposed to the district but we have to create an appropriation for it so that we can receive funds from the district to spend them. So this is where it starts, is the Sheriff's Office will propose a budget in their budget, the county budget for the district, but when the budget committee meets for the district, they'll hear the presentation for this budget and they'll either uh, adopt it or not. Now, that budget committee happens to be three of the same people sitting at this table, so that's the link to, to the two budgets, and the, that budget committee and that district is well, that district is governed by the board of commissioners as the district governing body, and then three lay members. So and and you know, so this is what we presented to them. So that's that's my only concern. So if you believe that to be this. inaccurate, then we need to we need to get that clarified. And if you're if you are intending, I think that you have. I'm pretty certain that you have eight now. You may not have them assigned that way, and you might want to check that. That was my thought. Because on my on my labor reports, I have seven. Not unless there was a change that I was not aware of. But I was going to If we're, so, and the other thing is, if you didn't still want to add one, then that's going to be probably something you need to consider not talk. doing just because you, you won't, you'd be able to add it until you spend through that fund balance and then that's it. Okay. Yeah, Understood. Well, hey, you can, you can serve the lighting district too, I guess. <laughs> I'd be awful to use sheriffs to change light bulbs. Yeah. <laughs> Deputies, that would not be good. Going with it. <laughs> Talk about it. Talk about it. The support services is where you also went up in FT a little bit. Is that just shifting bodies around? Um, yeah, and actually we put in a, put a budget adjustment in for that. And that was for the sergeant that was going to retire, and then changed his mind and retire. So that was increased with the budget adjustment this current year. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to get into the numbers. Can I ask a question before we get into the numbers? I'm seeing two positions moving out of admin, 2.25 out of corrections, adding five to the criminal, and then adding 1.7 to the support. That's an increase of 1.95 FTE over last year. Actually, Doug, I went over that. Not not quite correct. Um, I'm just going by the numbers in which I'm reading here. Yeah. So here's how it works. Um, in corrections, they reduce positions from 49 to 48. So you got one reduction there. They re reduced a criminal data tech position, which you're not seeing because it's part of the whole program, but not just the, in, in the corrections division. Uh, by one FTE. Uh, they, they eliminated four lieutenant positions in their position control. I realize that they were going to talk about what they replaced that with. Um, and they added uh, undersheriff. 
There was also an extra lieutenant position. That's what I was going to say. The reduction in corrections that was well, an extra lieutenant. Yeah. Okay. So let me explain that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the adopted, because you're, you're, I'm assuming you're looking at the adopted budget to the department requested, or are you looking at the? I'm looking at the full-time equivalent. So it's a 14, 15 adopted for 64.5 to the department requested a 62.25. Okay. So as I said in the beginning, at the, be the beginning of this budget cycle, in the adopted budget, they had 163, 165.3 FTE. In the current year, part of this board that added, they went to 170.75. Okay, so they added multiple positions, not with funding. They didn't get additional appropriation. They just got additional FTE appropriation. They were going to fill those positions within their existing budget by underspending in other categories. Okay? That was in the revised budget of the current year. From that revised number, they dropped down to 165.75 in this proposed budget from the revised number. But that 165.75 is a net increase of 0.45 FT over last year's adopted budget. This doesn't reflect the revised. Right. Okay. That explains it. Thanks. Okay. It's not confusing at all. Not at all. <laughs> as long as we know that there's a revised number in there. It's extremely confusing. And it took me a minute to figure that out. I thought, how did I lose people? Where did they go? It wasn't matching up. By noon, you the sheriff and the bar, its basic structure and how many people in each of these areas. You can probably get it on it. You have that when you get your budget. Remember, this is before that. This is just looking at numbers. You, but when we give you your budget binder, you have that on the front page. Yeah, I mean, in this case, there's so many people involved. Well, you, well, you all don't have this, okay? But you know, I don't. I don't want to start. This is for the purposes of my review. This right. is really for you to, to kind of follow along. But this is position control by every department. It shows me every position that's had, every position that's taken away, the total FTE, the total revised FTE, and the total proposed FTE. So if you have this sitting in front of you, you probably follow along a lot. A, a lot more quicker, but you know, each time we do this, we start handing you more and more information, and pretty soon you got you know packets that you don't even want to look at. So, you know, but what we do when we bring you the budget is you do have a, an organizational chart that will show by division where the FTE are. I mean, and you'll have last year's budget to compare that to. Yeah, I would just take a nice line in the bar graph. That's what I understand. Yeah, that's what it has. You know, Dave, I have to say this when. Uh, Sheriff Falls first came on board, he started talking to me about, as the liaison of the Sheriff's Department, he started talking about the, what he was looking at for positions and how it would work out and the modifications from the, the previous Sheriff. And I have to say I've been extremely impressed with what he's doing because it's basically bringing it in line with a lot of industry standard and basically a, a, a work to employ, uh, employee to a supervisor ratio. It's more uh, five to one type concepts. So it's a, uh, I'm, I'm really impressed with what he's thinking here. We can, if you want, with that one chart, we can, I can show both what, what the previous year was and what, what my changes are. We, we do have that. Oh, okay. When you submit your budget, when they actually, these are not budget binders. These are working documents that we're taught working from. They're, at the, but the time they do the budget hearings, they're used to having that product, and they will have that. Every department submits a little chart, and they have the comparison to last year. Okay. And we did used to put the revised number in here, but uh, it really is a moving target because it's, it's valid as of the day that we were on the next month. We could have another change in the FTV, especially health and right. services, and then we got to change the numbers and go through everything. So we just don't. And ORS doesn't require it, so um, we drop that off. We do have it here in this report. I just have to remember the revised numbers. What, what, what I try to do, Dick, this is what you've asked me to do, and you specifically have asked me to do, which the rest of the budget committee's been uh, favorable towards us. Just tell you the total difference in FT. Do we have more FT or not? How many? And that's what I did to start this off. This budget shows 0.45 increase in FT over what we adopted. It actually shows a reduction over what's been revised during the year by the board. So, but a 0.45 over last year adopted, and that's what you've asked me to do in the past. So that's, I, I made it simple when we started off by saying that, um, because that's what, I mean, 
that's typically what you've wanted to focus on is what's yeah, the well, net we just got so much reorganization and talking yeah. unless we get new over it's just difficult to follow. I'm the one that asked the questions. You're not that old. I think Commissioner <laughs> Breidenthal maybe confused himself even. I did. <laughs> uh, that was a joke. Okay. I got it. I, I got it. No, I did. Okay. I forgot the uh, revise. You got to remember that. Um, I talked a little bit about in the beginning, and, and I'm going to work through the numbers now. I actually have some stuff that I want to go over uh, real quick on these. So I'm going to start on page one under Sheriff's Admin of the March Budget Review document. It's page 15, I think, in the binder. I could make another pot. I'm good. I just wanted to make sure you had what you wanted. Oh, I have no. Okay. So I, I see some big chunks of money here that, that are changing, and I want to ask about some of them. But in the sheriff's admin contracts and state grants, it looks like you lost $122,000 on the uh, fourth line down. Yeah, it says contracts and grants. What I want to make sure is that you know we're not supplanting the loss oh, of the grant no. with general fund because that is one of the budget committee's policies. And so, if there's something that this was specifically tied to, what do we do about losing the revenue? Yeah, Is most likely Title Three. No, you have Title Three later. Yeah, that's in the. Well, I have it in the emergency. Oh, never mind. I see what you're saying. Okay, they're going to look. They're going to okay, look this up. So let, let's go past that one. Um, emergency performance Oh, that was that was moved around. Okay. okay. So we're, we're so the next two lines down from that, it's forty two one oh five point five five zero zero. You show revenue of one hundred and forty five. Yes, That's I switched those around. line items around. Okay. So you didn't lose it. No. It actually increased. It increased a little bit. Yes. Okay. Going on down, just so everyone understands, um, and I'm going under grants, uh, actually fees and other service charges. 45, 199, Title three fee. So Title three went from 100,000 to 55,400. There's a couple reasons for that. We, you know, the pup, we had two different forms of Title three last year, 106, 393, which was eight years old, that we had carried, it's now eight years old, that we had carried forward a fund balance each year. That fund had more discretion in use for Title three. We, reserve that to be spent down public safety, that's that's gone. And then the new Title III became more restrictive. So under the new Title III, search and rescue and the overhead for that is pretty much what it was limited to in the sheriff's budget. Um, this is based on the fact that they couldn't use all of what we budgeted. In other words, search and rescue depends on whether or not you're doing search and rescues to be able to be reimbursed by Title III. And so we're not gonna, we don't want to stick a bunch of money in the budget that they can't use or won't use. Um, we have obligated the Title III funds for this year, uh, for last year and this year, prior to coming to these fiscal years because the federal government required to be obligated or else we had to return them. 
And so whatever we don't use at the end of that period of obligation could be required to be returned to the federal government. However, there's pending legislation now for another reauthorization. So there's this is a little moving target, but it was a significant decrease over what we budgeted in the past. So I wanted you to kind of have a little bit of information about that. And if you if you want more, we can we can get it. But Title Three comes along with our timber subsidy with you know our uh, public our, our O and C revenue. What? SRS. SRS. Um, one other thing that I saw, and I just wanted to point out for you all, and I'm pretty sure, Sue, this is the same reason. Under Sheriff's Administration and Retirement, it's 62205.6600. You see a re uh, reduction of a million seventy-one thousand. That actually got pulled out, and it looks like it got moved to standard. Yes. So. In the sheriff's budget, and they're the only place where this exists, we have another retirement system besides PERS. We have what's called standard. And we're pretty soon gonna be out of that system because we'll have everyone set up in an annuity once they retire. So this will be backed out of the sheriff's budget, but it'll also reduce the sheriff's budget budget target because that expense will no longer exist. But this is for employees that predated the transition to PERS and they chose to remain in that retirement system. And that was something that we had that were required to provide by law. We've almost got everyone retired out of that, but not everyone is. We, we pay for that as we go, so essentially we carry this, but then once, it, once they retire, we set it up in an annuity, and then we're out of it. I'm gonna jump now through that. That was correct, right? It, it yes. was because you moved to San I just yes. wanna make sure. Uh, and as I did tell tell you, once we get out of administration here, so the next uh, budget is corrections. And I just want to, you know, because I, I, I said this when we first started and, and also kind of to show you how good of a job the sheriff's office did with their budget given the circumstances they had to work through contractually. Under revenues for corrections, if you go to, um, and it's on page 20 of the uh, paper uh, budget information you all have um, it's JCSCA medical insurance so this is just for the corrections division but you'll see it jump $144,615 um, which is which is significant uh, and if we do that by division you'll see where I said earlier it's about $400,000 in additional cost just for insurance for the JCSCA I'm going to go down a little bit from there to the next page, page 21, and I want to I want to point something out here uh, under it's chargeback IT chargeback. It's 641.20.0302, and you'll see a very significant increase in IT chargeback to corrections. Uh, this was mentioned when we met with the IT director in their budget review the other day. This is for video arraignment. This is the new video arraignment uh, portion, and I did tell you that. Uh, this was split between the sheriff's budget based as the primary user, community justice as a minimal user, and we do have an agreement from the courts. As I, I think I told you all the other day, we were going to ask the courts to participate in this. They participated last time when we bought the video arraignment system, which was about 800000 This time we're projecting about 450000 The last time they contributed $50,000 to the $800,000 project. This time they're going to contribute $50,000 to the $450,000 project. So what will happen is once we get the agreements in place, this will be undercharged slightly, but not by a lot. But um, just so you see, because of that big difference in the budget, that's what it is. And we have done some estimates in the past on cost savings for that, as we discussed the other day with IT, that enables the sheriff's office to be able to keep corrections deputies in the jail, not have to move people across uh, from the jail to the court, which is a safety issue, and so on and so forth. Okay, I'm going to skip all the way down to criminal. And I did have some questions on this. Uh, it's page 23 of the document that you all have. And I'm going to go down to uh, 41105 point thirty three seven five the drug enforcement grant. So that dropped from hundred and thirty to three thousand. Is that because you're choosing not to pursue it or is it 
We don't know yet what the federal government's going to do in relation to marijuana eradication. And we've asked them, and they haven't come to a conclusion yet. So we decided just not to budget for it. Okay, so you'll need to do, if you decide to do something, do a supplemental. Okay, and then a couple lines down from that's the Hyda grant. Is that the same thing? Hyda is high intensity thing. drug trafficking area, and we qualify as a high intensity drug trafficking area. We receive grant funds for drug enforcement. So, and that has been going down for the current year. We had anticipated 40,000, and so far we've been about 3,000. Yeah. Okay, so that's almost gone. Okay, so that's that's a big chunk of money in your criminal division 167 yes. that you won't and be I doing. Took it out on expenses. I, I'm assuming you won't be doing the activities, uh, right? Correct. Right. Yeah, okay. And there's then, some overtime related to that, and then a lot of contract services, a lot of flight time, and so we just eliminated that out of the expense line. So what do you see as the impact of the community as a result of that? This was the combined, right, this was originally in the SOTNT. Yeah, and we combined that into to our criminal investigations, and part of it, because we don't know what the with the legalization of marijuana July 1, we don't know what how that's going to impact cartel grows or outdoor grows, which a lot of this was, was earmarked for. So uh, the, the impact of the community is gonna be based on the legalization also. And we just don't know that. The wild west of marijuana. Yeah, it, 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 it is, and, and that, when we moved it out of TNT to, to put it under criminal investigations, it was partly because of that, because of the movement we saw for legalization of marijuana. I don't know if we're going to be running around in the woods as much this summer dealing with cartel issues if you can go down to the supermarket and buy it. Well, not the supermarket, but... <laughs> the dispensary coming near you. That's close enough. <laughs> <laughs> and DA and BLM, yeah. they yeah. have not given us an answer. I think they're still trying to determine what they're going to do. And, and I, I've met with the BLM and the United States Forest Service and talked to DEA a little bit. They can do uh, a lot more of the uh, helicopter flying, especially on federal lands, than what we've had them do in the past, which will cut back on a, a, a savings also. There's a lot of part of that came out of our budget. So so I see them taking more of a lead on some of those investigations, specifically on United States Forest Service land that, that we've taken a lead on in the past. And BLM too. Right? And BLM also. So all uh, all interior and agriculture department lands. Be a better way to say that. Well BLM and Forest Service lands, yeah. 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 It's the same thing. Well, they, you know, there's more to them now than just those two out there if you talk about those parts. Yeah. Okay, well, the, 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 I guess what I'm trying to say is the governing bodies that yeah. would, that would govern those, um, I, I see as, as an opportunity that they could take more of a lead on those, and, and I've had those discussions with them. So we previously had the option of doing the work and being reimbursed. Mm -hmm. and what Sheriff Falls is saying, we're not going to exit that option anymore, we're going to ask them to do it if they want it done. Yeah. Is that going to reduce the workload on your admin staff from having to ask for that reimbursement and giving all the requests? It's a little bit. I would imagine so, and, and not just on our admin staff, it's it's going to be on our support. Services. Okay, I need to I need to move through a little more quickly. Uh, we're, we're supposed to be done with this one at 2.30, so... <laughs> on, Ask me a question, go, sorry. I, I know, going a little bit further down, uh, ODOT truck inspections, it's not a lot. But I was when I saw in your submittal that you said the contract ended. Right. And I'm wondering if you're not renewing it. We're this, not this, renewing. Is there a reason? This is something you cite in the Justice Court. Yes. And it does have an effect on your traffic team. Um, the state has decided that OSP will be the ones. They did this about 10 years ago. Because they don't want them cited to Justice Court. They want them cited to circuit court. That's my thinking. They haven't said that. But they're going to have no, the that's troopers why. do the truck inspections and not the state wants to do which is really ridiculous, just so you all understand. When we do it, the state gets a check for half of the revenue without any expense. When they do it, they have the cost of operating a full circuit court, which is five, at least five staff. And, you know, keeping the expense except for the distributions that are required by law. It's it's just ridiculous. But anyways, I wanted to know what happened. Is this an administrative change or a 
a uh, legislative change? It's well, I the, it's probably OS. It's probably leg the legislature and OSP directing. Or it's OSP deciding. Combination. The OSP has been directed. This is according to the OSP lieutenant assigned to our area that they don't cite into our justice court even for traffic. They cite into the state circuit court. Every other police agency will cite into our justice court. Will doesn't mean they have to, but they will. State police has to cite the circuit court, which is once again ridiculous in my opinion for traffic, especially. Um, going on down, I, I see that your Marine board grants, but I see that it looks like that dropped statewide. It did drop statewide for everybody, and we took a point five of that person and put them to patrol. Okay, I'm going to go to page 25, and I just want you to note the top of the page we're in criminal. JCSEA medical insurance and criminal up $195,915. Turn the page again and again. Let's see, keep going. I'm almost through these. So I'm going to go page 32, uh, about halfway down the page. 62205-3450, which is JCSCA Medical Insurance in Support Services, up 114900 So when I said at least $400,000 increase just in medical services, we're over four hundred dollars now. I'm, I'm telling you that not necessarily to point out JCSCA, but to point out the sheriff's budget only went up three hundred and some thousand dollars and he has more than that in increases in cost just for medical services, uh, medical insurance increase for the sheriff's uh, union. So all the way at the last page, just this is where I talk about the difference from the adopted budget to the department requested and what we'll be proposing. $316,000 increase uh, in the total budget. Still more resources, but not a lot more resources, and they're being spread more thinly be a lot because of the contractual requirements for the union. That's where your cost went up the most. And I saw in every program, this was my last question, in every program just about you reduce contract services fairly significantly. Is there a reason for that? Or are you just not going to, I mean, what kind of stuff are you cutting out, I guess? Um, we cut out a lot of flight time. A lot of that had to do with the medical medication. And there were some other programs that were particular check winners that we So as we said earlier, in the review of the Justice Court's budget, sometimes the sheriff generates enough revenue to cover it, and sometimes they don't, and we go in and out of it. Harvey's pointing out that it's not generating <laughs> enough revenue to cover the additional traffic staff that we're at. In that uh, the, the union contract, is there no uh, percentage increase in the health insurance that triggers any sort of a reduction in benefits or an increase in participation clause of any kind? No. Hmm. And, and it's not, I'll be honest with you, it's not <coughs> something that we'll be able to negotiate. I, I'm just being blunt because that's not status quo. And to try to bargain backwards from status quo with a strike bar prohibited unit is almost virtually impossible. What we try to do is maintain status quo. Mm -hmm. um, in the last arbitration we actually did, we still gave raises even though the county won. The union felt like they were uh, mistreated essentially in that arbitration. They were asking initially for what would have been about seven million plus in increases in pay and benefits. And we ended up somewhere under a million dollars over the term of the contract. I think it was about 1.2 million, but we still gave increases. Because we're subject to an arbitrator's decision, it's you know one choice or the other. So uh, the only way that it could possibly happen for that particular issue is if our offer prevailed more in every other spot and the arbitrator kind of you know gave us gave gave up gave our offer or I'm sorry their offer prevailed better in every other spot and you know they they didn't want that and our and, and our offer prevailed better in every other spot and we did want that 
Um, so, and, and I'm not saying every other spot, obviously an arbitrator looks at all the factors, but they pick one side or the other's proposal. And when your proposal isn't status quo, you typically don't win in strike bar with a strike bar unit. It just seems like an area of a lot of um, fluctuation and, and uh, I, I, I guess it's a tough one to, to well, negotiate, but. One thing that, you know, this, this is something that has bothered me for a long time is any time that we can be creative and figure out ways to save money right. lowers their total compensation. Even if, for let's say for example, the sheriff's union, we put them into self-insurance and we were able to save a million dollars a year. That tells the arbitrator that they're comp totally a million less. They don't look at the benefit in the plan, they look at the total cost sudden we're a million dollars behind for their group. So even if we can get creative and figure out ways to do things better that cost less money, we're penalized in the end because we look at total compensation and we have you know, many ways to reduce the cost of these things, but then that means we end up having to pay more. It's very counterintuitive. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's a flaw in the system for mm -hmm. sure. And we argue at every legislative session like, you know, but the public Employees Collective Bargaining Act is pretty strong in our state. That experience is good. Is there anything that you wanted to add that we didn't cover in your budget? Okay. Anybody have any? We're, we're about 15 minutes behind, but anybody have any other questions? I know I think you said you had to leave at 245. Yeah. Well, here I'll leave at the same time the sheriff does. I'll be back in 20 minutes. <laughs> okay, we're going to do community I gotta justice. I got to go pick up my grass. Uh, uh, you mm -hmm. you know, so you'll have to sit over here in the chair for a while. Oh, that would be good. Be good for uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> First grader. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bring crayons. Yeah, yeah. Just, send them over to you. Just yeah. sick so my <laughs> wife can't go. <laughs> this is the way it is sometimes. Oh, man. <laughs> Grandpa. Yep. Grandpa gets the job. Grandpa gets the job. Yeah. It's the best job. Yeah. No, right, right. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll double check. Um, their supervisors and Bob Campbell. So far, your daughter upset over the results over the weekend? Yeah, she was upset. Too bad. Yeah. Didn't see that coming. No. Uh, How's her wrist? It's doing well. Okay. Yeah. 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 Are we taking a quick break here? Or we're we after this budget, we are. Oh, okay. Okay. We're supposed to already have had one. be close to being yeah, done at I three. Understand. We're scheduled at three for a break. If you want yeah. to run, though, if you're, yeah, you're all not. right, I'll make it. <laughs> <laughs> Please hear Don't that. worry about yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you got to sit here. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's I guess this is really for our information. We get a chance to ask questions later. Okay. Okay. Pick up. Good. Well, I try to give you the chance to ask questions now, but we, you know, gotta stay, gotta keep it close to being on the That's time. That's all right. <laughs> uh, why don't you all introduce yourself to everybody here? I'm Shane Hagee. I'm the director for Community Justice. And we actually, um, Cricket's usually with me in the we so we've got an extra uh, person from the department that's this is his first time to go through a budgeting process. He works with the county issues out of the transition center, so it was kind of an opportunity to get him a chance to see everything that's going on and exposed to the process. And yeah. I'm Cricket, the budget manager of yeah. Community Justice. Stephen Mullins, I don't know what he's talking about. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, and your name is? I'm <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for uh, community justice, they came in $2 under their budget target. <laughs> uh, $2 under? $2 under, yeah. I was going to I thought you were over for a minute. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but you were going to kick it in? They came in over. You know that wouldn't have happened. Uh, I don't know, it's Hagee now, you never know. <laughs> So they have an increase from the adopted budget, which was 123 FTE, of 4 FTE to 127 FTE. 
that's as revised in the current year though. So they're already added. They're, so they'll go from 123 in the adopted budget to 127 FTE in the next budget. Three of those are in the adult side. Uh, those three are associated with a mental health grant that the county applied for and received that added FTE to the mental health uh, specialists and a deputy, a senior deputy parole and probation officer. And then they had one additional FTE um, in uh, juvenile, um, which is an assistant position, staff assistant position. Um, I think I talked about this, so Craig, may, you may have been the only one here. I don't even know if April was here again, but we had shifted some general fund a couple of years back from the sheriff's budget to community budget justice budget to make the transition center work it was a million dollars and we were going to reduce that back we were trying to get through the state funding cycle because we knew the state would come back uh, to get through those two years uh, reducing that general fund support that 500,000 year we did that this year there's a very significant increase in their budget in Community Corrections Act funding which is what we were anticipating that the state funding would be coming back up to an appropriate level this program is essentially split up into three units the transition center adult services and juvenile juvenile is a county required fun function so the county is required to provide juvenile services the adult supervision and transition center used to be a state uh, delivered service sometimes contractually by the county sometimes directly by the state the law changed in 1995 under Senate Bill 1145, which transferred jurisdiction for all services for offenders sentenced to a year or less to the counties. Um, it had a contingency in it for counties that the state had to provide current service level funding. In other words, they couldn't cut the funding or else the program would, could revert back to the state. It was the county's option whether the county opt that out of delivering those services. So anytime the state reduces funding below baseline, it creates a new opportunity for the county to opt out of this providing the service. In our case, and it's because of how we deliver the service, the county has a net benefit from delivering the service. In some counties, they have a deficit. The place where they have a deficit is where they take all of these offenders and just put them in jail because jail is the most costly option you can have. In our county, we have multiple other options. So if you take some place like uh, Wasco County. They're not going to have a transition center. They're not going to have electronic house arrest. They're not going to have work crews. They're not going to have inpatient treatment. They're going to have a jail bed. So in those counties where they put everybody in that option only, then they lose money. The county ends up subsidizing the program. In our county, we get what's called a capitated rate for everyone we supervise. And I think, is anyone you good with that calling member last time I explained mm -hmm. the capitated rate? It's the same thing in their budget where we get a rate, a flat rate for each type of offender, and it doesn't matter whether we have them spend their time in jail or in the community on supervision or anywhere in between that range. The lower we move them down on the range, the less costly it is to us, and then the difference in those costs becomes funding available to us to use discretionarily within the program. It has to be used within the program, but it's discretionarily used. In our case, the funding that comes to the county, we immediately take 1.7 million of that and put it in funding our jail. Okay, so I talked about that in the sheriff's budget where they get money from the Community Corrections Act. That's because of this program being at the county. So we just got 1.7 million in funding for our jail that we wouldn't have had. Now we also got the offenders that came with that. And if we were keeping all of those offenders in jail, as I just explained, it would be more costly, but we're not, we're moving them out to other programs. So this year, uh, and I always do this with this budget and also human services budget. These programs are funded on a biennial basis. Okay, The state hasn't set their biennial budget, so we're making estimates on the revenues. That's true for the adult and the transition programs, but also for the juvenile program, which I said is incumbent upon the county to deliver. The county puts a lot of general fund into that program, but we also receive funds uh, from the state through the juvenile uh, crime prevention plan. So in all three of these programs, we're making estimates on revenues that are primary, primary to the programs that 
They're just estimates because the state hasn't adopted a budget. And once the state does adopt a budget, then we're taking what the state does over two years and translating that into a one-year uh, budget. So uh, what we did, you know, uh, essentially, we have a governor's budget um, that does ramp up funding in community corrections uh, and also in um, what are we calling the reentry program now? The Justice Reinvestment. Yeah, Justice Reinvestment Act. So there's two different funding streams. Um, what Shane and I talked about doing is just using the baseline. So because we know we can depend on the baseline, for the most part or else the state will trigger an opt-out and they don't want to trigger an opt-out, so that's what we've depended on. It is possible we'll receive additional funds above the baseline. There's a proposal for, I think, 59, how many million is it? 58.5 58 .5 million from the state uh, from the governor's budget that is through the uh, Justice Reinvestment Act. And that could range anywhere from that 58, 59 million to nothing. So we get about 6% of that funding. And in the Justice Reinvestment Act, for, there are people that don't participate in that. So the actual amount of funding available to us becomes more because we're a larger percentage when other counties don't participate. Um, as I said, four additional positions, they're all existing in the current budget, will be moved into next year's budget, met the budget target. Um, I did have a couple questions for you, uh, and I do want to point this out to you all, all here. I'm going to go to the budget numbers again, uh, <clears throat> and I'm not going to necessarily go by program, but I do want to point out, if you go to page 14 on your documents in this budget, uh, the union that represents the parole officers is called FAPO, Federal uh, Association of Parole and Probation Officers. Yeah, and if you look at about, no, it's about three quarters of the way down the page, 62205.2100, uh, FAPO medical insurance went up $125,000, 667, $125,667. That is for 18 people. So, and they won in arbitration recently, which bound us to that. That would be enough to add at least one and a half another right. FTE. Um, so, I, because we talked about that, they're not aware of what we talked about on the sheriff's budget. Because we talked about on the sheriff's budget, I want you to know this is our the strike bar unit. This one actually went to arbitration and they prevailed. And, and their logic for getting it was the county could afford it. So you ought to do it, bro. <laughs> that was their logic. We yeah. had stuff on our side that showed comparables and showed all kinds of stuff. And they so then it's just a current team. funding piece, or was a retroactive payment um, a part of this? Um, yeah, there. Well, there wasn't a retroactive payment because this isn't a payment directly to them, but it's towards their insurance benefits. Yes. Yeah. yeah the, the the coal is applied retroactively. Um, this was for the next budget. They, they make a proposal per budget year, so this is for this budget year. It wasn't applied retroactively. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip all the way up to page 20, and I wish Dick Rudisile was here because I just wanted to point this out. <laughs> About a quarter of the way down the page, it's 64205-7200, um, Rogue Community College Client Fire Training. So we're going to contract with Rogue Community College to be the fire training program where we used to do it ourselves. And you know he would have liked that, right? Oh, yeah. I told him we're helping out the budget. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I did have a question for you all. Uh, in Community Justice Administration, page 22. Okay. Community Justice Administration. Yeah, I think it's our. Oh, well, the page on the side. Yeah. Okay. This, this was one that just kind of caught me off guard, and I know that you know I looked at the totals with Harvey from last year on extra help, but this is under administration, and you have added fifty six thousand one hundred sixty dollars as extra help, which you haven't had in prior years. What what's going on with that? Uh, part of it is we are hiring a background uh, extra help background this year. Just by contract or yeah. as, a, as an extra extra help employee. Extra help employee. Okay. Yeah. And that's, so before we had to put that in administration costs at all. Those were 
those are put out by each of the divisions of the department. So that's a, that's a position that I've been contemplating for quite a while, speaking so many background investigations for any, any agency that's even bringing people in for a short amount of time to, you know, any kind of classes at the juvenile, adult, whether they're volunteers, students, whatever there is. We take the, um, we have to do pretty severe background checks, so they, um, it takes up a lot of time with several of my managers that work on those a lot, so I'm looking at putting a, in a position that's has experience doing investigations, like I would say a uh, part-time retired investigator or something like that along those lines, that has the experience to do that and um, can save us a lot of energy and time, so you know, that's the focus of that. Oh, also, that's the other piece that's in there. Oh, the, the uh, laser fish piece that we were converting to with IT, that was one of the other concepts put in the back. So, did you all catch that? What number is this? Most departments, um, I'm sorry, I turned from that page already. Oh, sorry. Oh, there, I got it. I see it. I'm there. It's uh, page 22. Huh? I was up the page. So, uh, he, taught, he just explained the background investigator piece, but also in most county departments, we've been converting everything to laser fish or digital documents rather than you know, having people have to go look up paper, PDF. Goodness, what is that system called? Bill paper files. Uh, microfish. Rather than microfish. That is a that is a yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. surprise I remember that. So what they're gonna bring on temporary staff to basically scan documents. Uh, and now going to juvenile, I kind of thinking Joe might be here today. I had a lot of questions on this. Um, so I'm on page 24, where Juvenile Services Miscellaneous starts the bottom half of the page. I'm just saying this for everybody out there. Um, title 4E, uh, going a little bit down, ODA, YDD grant. A little further down, Juvenile Detention Contract Fees. That looks like a swap with the one right below it. But the first two, and actually even uh, the YDC gain grant, those are a lot of additional grant loans. And I see you're contracting them out later yeah. with right. Kids Unlimited or Contract and Art. I'm familiar with those programs. Yeah, they're subcontracted out. That's part of the grant to get people better. It comes through us. We put the money out to them. Yeah. That's what you So this is the, these, the, the, well, the top two that I mentioned, which are item number 42105.7900. And 42105.8825. You'll see those budgeted as revenues. They're not in the current budget. That's because they've applied for a grant. We haven't received, and the board hasn't yet uh, agreed to enter into an agreement. We've submitted an application for those grant funds. And in expenditures, you'll see contracts out. So it's not a service the county's going to deliver. Essentially, the county serving as the fiduciary agent for what the services are going to be. And I'll point those out when we get into expenses. If you turn the page 26, the top of the page you'll see multiple uh, expenses, Kids Unlimited, <coughs> Life Art, On Track, uh, and Spartan Boxing. So those are all contracts for those grant funds, or they, they will be contracts for those grant funds. You can see they didn't exist in previous years. Thank you. Um, I will point out, although there's a significant increase in Community Corrections Act funding, their overall budget's actually down $231,309, even with the grant appropriation. So, um, considering the significant increase in health costs, the fact that they met their budget target, um, and uh, the additional grant funds, the fact that they're down 231000 is commendable. Um, once again, probably doing more with less uh, and in a less expensive way. I don't know if you all caught the gist of the fact that bringing someone as a temporary background check person and temporary people want to do microfish means we don't pay benefits and we don't pay retirement and we don't pay health insurance and all of those things that cost us additional money. So you can see in their budget they're making efforts to do things 
to reduce costs for some of the stuff they're trying to accomplish, and it reflects in the bottom line of their budget. So is there anything that you want to cover that I didn't? No, I think you probably already covered before that, well, you did mention about the, you know, it really depends upon what happens at legislature right now, what our funding's gonna look like, and, and so it's been, uh, programs that we've put in place, we've done, been able to work really collaboratively with the Sheriff's Office and um, in trying to reestablish treatment back into the jail and then move that out in our transition center and, and make that a priority with those Justice Reinvestment Act funds. And uh, I think that's, it's something that I've been wanting to do for the last 10 years I've been here. We've been trying to push for, to increase and, and make that more of a sustainable program that, that doesn't have the seams in it that's had before where we lose people between um, movements whether it's for mental health or treatment or, you know, the jail. So we're bridging those gaps, and I really hope those dollars continue to come in from the legislature so we can continue to increase that program and move into the next phase. Because I'd like to eventually put residential treatment out of the transition center as part of this program so we can have a full gamut of services. Well, will you explain to them, I don't think they're aware of what you did with the Justice Reinvestment Act dollars okay. in the jail currently? Okay, but what we did is we took the, um, the money that came in for this, this first round, and it, it's it's the initial phase of it, so it was all kind of, you know, it's new to everyone. But we, we um, in years past, they've not had treatment that's been in the jail for drug and alcohol, and, and so um, it's something that we wanted to have as part of the program. So when we have them in there, that it's not just dead time. We can start on there, um, at least in the first phase of the treatment, and then move them from there out into the community, either at the transition center where we offer treatment, or we would oh, into the um, at West Main have treatment when they're on probation and parole. So um, what's happened is, in the past, they've they've not allowed treatment in the jail, so we've taken everybody and just waited until they got out and we moved them to the transition center for treatment. This is a program where we have them um, for a period of time that they aren't gonna run away, they're not gonna go anywhere, and we can get them exposed to some of this. It's been, it's been a huge um, piece that's missing in our local system, I think, for, for quite a while, and it's been supported by the, the courts, the, you know, the judges, the treatment providers, mental health, everybody involved has been very supportive of it. So it's, I'm, I'm hoping to take, take it to the next phase. We now have it both for males and females in the jail, a pod that's just dedicated for treatment. And the next phase is to move them in, if open up the residential treatment, where we can take them out of the jail and move them out into um, the next phase, a step down into the community where they can, um, they can start receiving the same consistent treatment there, or if they come out to our West Main office, either way. So we have them covered no matter where we move those folks. So when you say treatment in the jail, what what does that mean? What it's drug they, and alcohol treatment. Yes. But and what will they have? They'll have. Uh, we have a counselor. We have a person that's set up for both um, males and females that have their own counselor. They receive um, a curriculum that's evidence based. That they they come into the jail. They they work with them. They have workbooks. They have groups. They have you know video instruction everything while they're in there so they're getting the same thing they would get actually more so than they would out in the it, it doesn't qualify as inpatient treatment or level no, three right. no, level no. three is where you are unable to abstain from the use right, on a daily right. basis so they're, they're detoxed it, it's not qualified as a residential facility okay. it's okay. essentially level two plus is what it would be okay. equated okay. to okay. so it's an outpatient based treatment that's high intensity okay it's, is so it's it, like personalized then to their needs or is it's it group and personal i mean the, up they hold groups and they also develop yeah, a personal group. treatment plan okay. and when shane talked about transitioning them so they may they may qualify for inpatient treatment but not be able to go because they're in jail right. this would be an alternative to having to go to inpatient treatment but they are captive uh, no pun intended mm -hmm. and so <laughs> then from from that point when they because they're in the custody of the supervisory authority people don't a lot of people don't understand this, but people don't get sentenced to jail anymore. They get sentenced to the custody of the supervisory authority. And the supervisory authority in our county is Shane, the director of community justice, and Shane determines where they spend their sentence. He can have someone spend their sentence in jail, he can have them spend it in treatment, he can have them spend it in the transition center, on house arrest, on supervision. So when he talks about transitioning them from this program to the next program, what he's talking about is they're getting this intense treatment in jail, and he may move them from jail to the transition center where they can continue their treatment on an intense basis or enter into a community-based outpatient treatment program and so on and so forth on down the chain until they complete the treatment and are in full recovery. So do you release them then, or the judge releases them, or how, how do they then get? Releases them from jail? 
problem with the treatment center. Yeah, they, well, the treatment provider determines that they've completed okay. treatment and okay. then they've met that condition. Okay. Good. Is it both adult and juvenile? Or just adult treatment? This is, well, we have juvenile treatment that's in the, that we associate with the juvenile center, but this is separate. This is just an adult field. Oh. We do have a program in juvenile services for people who are in custody for treatment as well, uh -huh. and for school and education. The, you know, the jail doesn't have the GED program, but the transition center does. So when they move from the jail to the transition center, they can get a GED program, they can get drug and alcohol treatment, they can get, you know, uh, <laughs> anger management, and domestic, everything they need. The difference and the reason why we created the transition center is when people are in jail, our tax base is paying for it. When they're in the transition center, one of the main goals is to help people get employed, and they pay to be in that program. So now they're paying for their own care and custody rather than the taxpayer paying for it. So we want to transition people out of jail to a lesser form of custody where they can become employed, which is, you know, in some studies shows that it can reduce recidivism by 70, 80 percent just by having a job, and where they can address whatever their court conditions are needs, and then transition into the community stabilized so they're not just put out on the street with nothing. I think it's, uh, the reason why this program is exciting to me at least is that we lose a lot of people in those gaps between services. And whether it, but while they're in there, they're getting, they get access to, of course, to you know, medical, but mental health. We're trying to tie other grants and other agencies into it. So um, with other grants we get, we're getting them, whether it's substance abuse or if they have mental health issues or a combination, we're getting them addressed while they're in there so we can then move to the next phase of wherever they need to be um, based on what their needs are. So we're, we're doing a lot more needs assessments and things like that. And it's just an opportunity that we don't lose people when we're moving them from, so you get out of jail and you go back to the community and you're supposed to go see your PO, or you're supposed to go you know, do all these, these items on your checklist, and we lose them in there because they don't always get to where they're supposed to be. So we can help with that and get them moving along because once they've been sober for a while, had a little bit of treatment, it's amazing how much better they do. Okay, thanks you guys. Hey, Dick, you, were, you weren't here, but I wanted you to know that on page 20 yeah. of their budget, I pointed yeah. out that they're now contracting with Rogue Community to do fire training for the clients. I thought you might appreciate it. Very good. Very good. And I did that without any prompting. I didn't even know it was Christmas. Yeah. It's just a great service there. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and bring the meeting back to order. Uh, somebody was smart. <laughs> Close to 320. So with the, this this actually should be pretty quick. With the clerk's budget, um, there's no change in FTE, uh, total FTE. There's a movement of 0.05 FTE between recording and um, elections. That's just based on workload. Um, so I, I don't really have any issues with the budget with the exception of there is a request that's above the budget target of a capital uh, outlay of $191,105 for ballot scanners. So I'd ask Chris to talk about that specifically um, because this was not something that was in the budget target that we set. Other than that, she, she did come in on her budget target. Um, and um, so that'll be a, a question that we talk about at the budget hearings. Um, but so go ahead and talk to uh, so please accept my apologies. Like I said, we're in just first day of hearing, so I apologize. Um, and as Danny stated, I did put the monetary funds requested above our budget target um, for new their scanners. Or what they are is actually a tabulation equipment that actually tabulates your vote. Um, there's a lot of different equipment in elections, but this is far and foremost the end game to get results out. Um, our current tabulation system was purchased in 07, uh, a portion coming from the HAVA funds that were supplied through the Secretary of State's office through the Help America Vote Act, small portion, um, and the rest was paid for through county funds. Um, as everybody knows, when it comes to computers and items that are in the computer world, uh, 07 is very old. As from the time you purchase equipment, immediately it's 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 old to the customer because there's a newer, better technology out there, or something that is going to be um, carry you into future years. So what we're looking at right now is 07 equipment 
These are actually certified through the year 2000 standards to the Elections Administration Commission. Um, and the technology in those is back to those standards. Um, if anybody knows what a um, we have thumb drives, we have all the different units, and these still take the little old, I don't even name them, not disc, floppies. but uh, not floppies, they zip, take zip the drive. zip drives. Yeah. Yes, they take the zip drives, which zip drives you can't even buy zip drives anymore. Um, so what I'm asking for in this is to keep Jackson County um, at the top of our game. I would rather be proactive than reactive. Uh, I don't want Jackson County making headlines for something such as being the last county in the country to report um, or having something fatally go wrong within those systems because as anybody knows computers age, there are things that can happen. Um, our current tabulation system runs off Windows XP. We have been told that there is a fix. Those are not networked though, if you're all aware of what networking is. So uh, we are covered as far as people worry about viruses and stuff, that's not something that we're concerned with at this point because they're not networked. Um, but as we know, Windows has uh, stopped um, upgrading and servicing Windows XP. Um, the SNS who did provide these and who was the vendor does have a fix, they say, to upgrade those to Windows 7, meaning the software. Um, it wouldn't nece necessarily be the machines themselves, it would be the Unity software that actually takes each machine when we download data and then we filter it in the Unity. That is actually what tabulates all those results together. Um, so what we're looking at is trying to come up with a solution and what I provided for you was the only, I did a request, just a very casual, what do you got out there for uh, monetary funds, just so I had something. This is in no way, shape, or form a contract or a absolute proposal for these items. In fact, we don't even know if that's the vendor will go with. Um, that's something we look at in the future when we can move forward with the project. Um, I did, in between, receive one other uh, just uh, a very um, uh, simple another request for proposal from another um, company, and I will probably continue to do this with what's available out there. So, so Chris, just for purpose of perspective, Chris mentioned this a little bit. Uh, HAVA is the Help America Vote Act, first of all. Um, and there are funds that have become available through the state for facilitating helping elections occur, basically. Uh, in 07, um, what the clerk meant, right? was, I wasn't. It was an 08. They were purchasing. Yeah, in 07, and she's not here to respond to my comments, but uh, our prior clerk approached us saying that the state would uh, provide HAVA fund matches for the purchase of these items. Um, so the budget committee at that point authorized the expenditure and then the state didn't provide funds. So the county ended up having to make, they sent most of, they, they purchased one of the, one, one piece of, a portion, portion of one piece of uh, one item of equipment, and then we purchased the rest. I think we purchased three more or two more or something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, four. So we pur they, they all purchased the first one, and then we ended up being stuck with the other ones. Um, last year, it's at the balance again. Sorter. The balance sorter. Um, the state had allowed us to test the balance sorter. And the test period ran up and they wanted us to purchase the ballot sorter and we said Chris made a request to the budget uh, the board of commissioners actually to authorize an expenditure and I essentially said you know we've had a bad experience with the state on this with HAVA funds and I talked about what happened in 07 and said you know that I think that we should decline this because I think that the state will then step up that they'll help fund it and it turns out that we told them no and <laughs> then the state agreed to provide it the funding to purchase the equipment. I mean, the state has a vested interest in making sure elections run well throughout the county. They are more than happy to allow the county to pay for something if we're willing to. So with that perspective and with that said, Chris, I want to know, is the state willing to make HAVA funds available for this purchase? Have we made that request? Is it something that qualifies for HAVA funds? 
rather than the county general fund paying for it or a portion of it, or have you inquired? The <coughs> clerks have actually, every uh, time we speak with the uh, Secretary of State's staff and office, um, have wanted to know what are their plans for the remaining HAVA dollars. We are one of the few states that still has millions of dollars left. And it's our understanding, and this isn't written in stone, that they are designating those funds to upgrade um, the Oregon Centralized Voter Registration, because that is now about 10 years old. Again, software, hardware, they're looking at a complete um, overhaul of Oregon Centralized Voter Registration. Now that being said, um, that's just what they're verbally stating. A lot of counties are in the same boat that we are, that they have and not just counties, but all counties all over the country, that they have these HAVA funds that help purchase equipment eight, ten years ago, and that equipment has now run its life cycle. So according to what we've heard from them, they have said they're earmarking that for that upgrade of the centralized voter registration system. Um, included in a portion of that, of course, is just the just signed bill today, 2177, um, making voter registration automatic when you go through the DMV. And I'm sure, just from what we've heard, a portion of that will go to upgrade, uh, do those upgrades as well. I can't 100% say that they wouldn't, but it would be my guess that at this point, with the remaining HAVA funds left, they would not, because there are all kinds of counties, not only in Oregon, but all over the country, that are looking for funds that just aren't there. We could always attempt. So what we use, you know, is something that has to be approved at the federal level and the state level. Chris talked about the committee that commit or the uh, commission that approves the type of equipment. It's very frustrating, I'm sure, to Chris, but also to all of us who have to decide how to spend the money. That it, and I, I just say this. I mean, it's my opinion that they do this on purpose, obviously, because they change the technology, knowing that you have to keep buying the new technology to stay compliant in order to uh, meet the federal and state guidelines and. They stop providing support for the old equipment, and uh, or the you know the support um, certainly doesn't perform as well as the performance of the new equipment. So when Chris talks about a fix to Windows XP, um, it's not going to be as efficient and as easy to manage and use as a new model. So um, we'll let you. You're not making a decision today, but I just wanted you to know that's coming your way. And we'll, I think you all know this, but we'll look for other options besides having to have the general fund do it. But I guess what Chris was saying, in the end, the state's not prepared to offer, even offer, to help fund what is required here. And, uh, but we can't ask. So I think that we, maybe we'll have Chris put in an ask, so at least we have that to bring to the budget committee. Something more formal from the state saying that they're not willing to do that or they're committing the funds to something else or whatever. They need to be aware of what the issues are at the local level for uh, facilitating elections while they're passing new laws to create new costs <laughs> that they can't afford to fund the existing costs for. So it acts as like a complaint mandate, more or less. Pretty much. Okay. And then, like I said, it's all over the country. It's not just here. And as you move forward, so it's frustrating on all ends. But you do know. We have an obligation for our citizens to make sure that their voice is heard through the elections process. And that's also part of making sure that we have the proper equipment, um, as well as the people up north and federally that are requiring these things without funding for them. What, what was the amount of the sort of the, got the total, um, give or take, um, including the first year's maintenance and licensing was $238,000. Uh, give or take, I don't know the exact number, but it was around that amount, uh, which is what HAVA funds through the Secretary of State's office and through that Help America Vote Act provided to purchase that sort of. They did tell us up front that those, they didn't have funds available for it. I know, I know. I said that I think that they're not, <laughs> I think they're bluffing because mm -hmm. they do have funds. My guess is that they could certainly use the funds they have now for something like this, especially to upgrade 36 counties. Some counties do take more of uh, interest in funding these items themselves. I think mean, Multnomah County would be an example. But let's remember they have a four dollar and thirty-four cent permanent tax rate with you know probably a hundred times our value. So 
they don't have to struggle like a lot of the rural counties especially do to cover with funds for something like this. I wasn't clear on the current equipment. Uh, if, if you don't get the new equipment, are you capable of uh, elections at least through another year? Uh, absolutely. We don't question that. Ours is taking us into the future, just like anything. Um, our equipment runs. Um, the, our problem we will run into is, is servicing the Unity software, the tabulation software, which, like Danny said, a fix is never a permanent solution. It's meaning we're, we're fixing temporarily this, this issue. Um, it's going to come up again, whether we do it now or later. But um, however we choose to move forward um, could be strategic. But um, but anyway, no, our machines run. As like, just like any technology, you have little idiosyncrasies with things, and anybody who come to observe our processes know that. Um, but but they will tabulate. I, I don't have a question that they will still do the job. Um, it's a matter of aging technology, aging equipment, and making sure that that we're up there and we know our equipment's not going to fail in they, a year or two years. They start charging us more and more for maintenance of older mm -hmm. equipment and getting parts and. Software fixes and that kind Just of stuff. Like all yeah. I've, I've, I've lost my hmm. Is this the best mouse trap this new one? Or well, that's why I said we haven't decided on. Coming out in a year that we haven't solely on decided that. on this piece of equipment. Oh, the, this was the only one I had available for some sort of monetary funding to look at. I have another one sitting right here somewhere around that range as well. But it's a totally different model. It would move us from how our processes work right now. We'd still tabulate. We'd still do all those things. It just has a different adjudication method. We would no longer be duplicating ballots when we had a ballot that wouldn't, a machine reject wouldn't go through or we wouldn't be enhancing. It would all be done on the computer so that the original ballot would remain as is. And there would be no duplicating a second ballot to go through the machine which by law we do have the right to do when the machine rejects those. Um, just, it's the same, it would get us to the same result, but there are some new software, new process out there that we are, we're looking at. Well, based on how Danny talks, uh, there's no doubt we need to do something, but let's not get in a big rush until we know we've got the right equipment and sort through who's going to pay for it. I'm not sure about necessarily the right equipment, but it would be more so what technologies are out there. Um, I think it's like yeah. this. I bought this Note 4 phone thinking I had the newest mm -hmm. stuff, and I just read that the Note 5 is coming out. Mm -hmm. I just bought this a few months ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, it's kind of the same thing with this kind of equipment. Yeah. But I do think we... Don't be, that tells me don't be in any rush. Yeah, we, you know, <laughs> we, we do need to put some pressure on the state, at least to let them know that we recognize that they have some responsibility here, even if they're not willing Is there any uh, preliminary estimates on the additional costs involved with uh, what's going to be obviously a larger voter base because of the whole motor voter thing? Uh, we have a little bit of information, not a huge amount from the state. They're estimating right off the bat between 13 and 15,000 new registered voters in Jackson County, and that is just going back to 2013 in that database. They may go a few years further back. Um, so they're talking the original estimates, 300,000 statewide that would add to the rolls. Now that's in Jackson County. Now if we had 13,000 new voters, 13 to 15, that would mean 13 to 15,000 more ballots every election, possibly um, higher turnout, more envelopes to send those out in, more envelopes that come back to us, more postage to send those out. So there are going to be costs where I do think we're going to see some savings will be on the front end of that process. Uh, right now, the last couple weeks before an election, we're just massively trying to get registration cards and we're paying overtime to our staff to make sure that all those are in before we do the extractions uh, to get those ballots inserted and all that. Um, and working weekends, doing all those different things. And I really think uh, the big registration drives through the parties do all those things. And if people are automatically registered, we're not going to have that front end rush like we would like we do now so I do believe there are going to be some cost savings on the front end of the process um, as well as less paper to have to print out registration cards um, those type of things 
I've heard a lot of those registration, uh, re-registration from one person moving from one party to another so they get the vote in a certain election. That's not being done at the DMV side, so those things would still be occurring they could, the but they, they have, uh, right now we have that um, OregonVotes.gov, you go right online and you can do all those changes online, as long as you have an Oregon driver's license or the last four digits of your social. Hey, um, we got to get moving. Yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, that's all right. There's a front end that's still there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yes. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Is the recording page at normal level now? Are we back to come Oh, down? absolutely not. CFPB, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau uh, regulations on mortgages, on originations, on title companies, on the banking industry has hugely restricted um, um, a lot of new loans being produced because of those restrictions and all those companies trying to navigate through what the restrictions are. Um, it's a protection for the consumer, but what it's done is it's kind of not tanked the mortgage market in, but the secondary mortgage market. Meaning, statistic I heard, one third of the people who back in 06, 05 qualified for a uh, refinance loan qualify now. Um, so the, that market is still not Dick and revenues, we were, gen we were estimating three quarters of a million dollars to the general fund. We're break even on the general fund right now. We're not making a contribution, but we're not close to where we were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I used to remember half a million dollars. Yeah, the last the last big one we projected was seven hundred fifty thousand before everything started sliding. Mm -hmm. So now, but their budget does support itself and generates I don't know, a minute amount to the general fund. I think it was like ten thousand dollars or something. Let me see. So they're anywhere from half a million to three quarters of a million dollar up sign potential. Here. But fourteen thousand dollars. Fourteen thousand dollars was the budget target. So there's, yeah. there's, yeah. Depending on what happens, but we got to move yeah. on. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Again, sorry for you being late. That's not going to happen. Right. Start this off real quickly. Uh, Roads and parks. Do you know everybody here? Do you guys both know everybody here? I know everybody. Mm -hmm. well, so go ahead and introduce yourself, Jay. I'm, I'm Jay Domus. I'm the deputy director for Roads and Parks. I work under John. Um, so, Roads and Parks is a non general fund department. So, they came in on their budget target, which was zero. I don't see any general fund. Um, the Parks Department used to be a general fund department. I think it peaked at about $2 million in general fund. Now it supports itself. It does generate a fund balance or maintain a fund balance now. Uh, one of the things I want to point out is there, there are, I mean, this is basically a status quo budget, same, continue along the same logic as we continued with maintaining our roads rather than investing in new capital improvements um, in the roadside. And in the uh, park side, there there isn't a change in FTE, but there is. So we, we kept the FTE in the budget, but we didn't fund two FTE, even though we left the, the appropriation for the positions there. We didn't fund them. And the reason why that is done that this way is because we expect a bad season in our parks. We expect a bad season because of the lack of water. Uh, we expect a short season, generating less revenues, so we're going to we're going to manage the staffing levels accordingly. But if we get some kind of last minute snowpack or big rush of water or some reason to have um, the need for the staff, the appropriation authority for the FTE is in the budget and the revenue will come and will increase appropriation through supplemental budget if we need to. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to you, John, just to kind of quickly go through. So 
I've, I've tried to just to summarize the major points of the budget. Danny already touched on some of them um, that, that we put together for this coming fiscal year. Um, as as Danny's noted on the road fund, um, right, pretty much what we're doing is we are maintaining our current system. Revenues are adequate to maintain the system that we have today. Revenues are not adequate to do a bunch of capital improvements. And so if the problem that we're trying to solve is we have a very narrow set of roads that were primarily built for Model Ts and we need to upgrade those, we're not doing it. If the problem is we're trying to take our gravel roads and pave the gravel roads, we're not doing that. If the problem we're trying to solve is keeping the current system as good, as in, as good a condition as it is today, we are accomplishing that. And that's basically the way that we put the, get, put the budget um, together. <coughs> um, as is the case with all other departments, um, anybody who receives federal timber and uh, secure rural school, we don't have any of that in the budget. That came down from four million several years ago down to, to, down to zero now. Um, for the general road maintenance, um, pretty much all of our activities that maintain the current system are going to continue at current service levels. So we're not going to be cutting anything. And uh, there are a few areas like pavement maintenance and striping in particular. Um, we are trying to increase uh, some spending there to make sure that our payments are in good condition and, uh, and our stripes are well up with any and people can see the roads at night and it's a safety issue. Um, a section there on that handout that talks about pavement condition, we had a real problem several years ago with the declining pavement conditions and as I've explained to several of you um, in past presentations, when you lose your pavement condition it is a huge problem because trying to get that back is horribly expensive. If you can do chip seals and cheaper kind of payment treatments, you can keep that condition in good shape. We upped our chip seal rate several years ago. We're going to continue it at that higher rate, and you can see it has made a difference. Our payment condition has, has turned back up, and we were back up to a 73 and expected to jump up to 74 next year. So that's the trend that we want to see. On the back side of the paper, you do see the, the capital construction fund is, is funded primarily through SDCs and some federal gas tax that we get, as well as a little bit of road fund. Um, and this is a, will be our lightest year for capital that we've had in many, many years. We really don't have a major capital project um, being delivered this year at all. Uh, but we are doing some design work on Lozier Lane, Table Rock Road from I-5 to Biddle. Um, and, um, and a small bridge on the Wheeler Road out in San Jose Valley will be replaced this year, but a very small capital a year for us. And then I'll just change topics to go over to the roads, the parks and re uh, from the roads over to the Parks and Recreation Fund. And highlights there. Danny noted it, that um, we're seeing lake levels right now that may be, there's all kinds of forecasts and it's difficult to know who to believe, but right now it appears that we may be seeing the lowest lake levels that we've seen in record. Um, they they got to get down their ways, but, but, but uh, Howard Prairie, they're predicting what they call Deadpool, which basically there's not even an outlet anymore. The, the lake is below the outlet level, and so basically after the evaporation is all that's draining lake at that point. <clears throat> and so we're expecting some uh, lost revenue because of that at the, at the parks. Typically at Howard Prairie, we've been um, in the neighborhood of uh, two to four permanent staff and about 10 to 15 temporary help. This year we plan on running Howard Prairie with six people. Um, we're making some significant cuts up there. We might not even open up uh, the South Camp Loop at all this year. Maybe just leave the South Camp Loop completely closed. No moorage at all. We're making quite a few cuts because of the low lake levels. That's going to have a corresponding impact on revenue. But as Danny noted, we're holding some positions vacant. We're not uh, hiring quite a few temporaries. And as a result, we're going to deliver the budget within the budgeted amounts, be in the black, and just have you know, a few less services because there's less water to, to do up there. Um, you know, I think with that, um, I'll, well, maybe the last thing to touch on for the parks. One of the things that we've seen in parks that is not be a part of the general fund. We need to make money at our parks. I don't like a business. And people like nice amenities. And so we're taking this opportunity to use some of the reserves that we have built in the park program to get some grants and match some grants and to continue to make some improvements at those parks that make us money. So we are adding a new restroom shower facility in the south loop of the camp of Howard Prairie. 
adding a, t uh, a ten unit year village, and we're starting some engineering designs on our new marina. Actually, moving the marina Howard Prairie into some deeper water, so some of these drought years we'll we'll be able to use it um, for a much longer time period. And um, I think with that, um, just take any questions that you got. So, yeah, exactly. Let me back up to one thing that wouldn't be in this current budget, which is we discussed a couple times is the RV park at the expo. And I think I explained in the December meeting that the pro forma that we hired a contractor to put together with us said that we would have about $3 million, roughly $3 million cost in investment to develop the park. Doing the design work internally, uh, John's staff have a projection that's much higher than that. And so the payback on that goes from you know 12 to 20 years to 30 years if the general fund were going to support the entire project. So that isn't in that amount of money, the 3 million, 2.8 million, I think is exactly what we were talking about, uh, isn't in John's budget. We will budget 2.8 million in fiduciary. So we're holding it there to be able to loan it because it's a loan <coughs> at this point as the board, previous board authorized us to move forward on the project if we make the loan. What we're going to do is complete the design work, put the bid documents together, go out to bid and see what we get. If it's significantly more, then we may shelf it and not pursue it and seek to raise some funds. There's many places we can go to, Matt, to, to get grants or those kinds of things potentially, uh, or we have the option of providing that design work and facility to a contractor to make the investment and then we do a profit share like we do on you know, other projects we have in the park. So we have some other options. We just don't know right now uh, until we get a little further down the road. So I want you to be aware of that, but we will put in the fiduciary the 2.8 million so it's there, but we may not be using it. Any questions for John? <laughs> Almost makes me nervous. I don't get any questions. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so tomorrow we start at 1.30 with the surveyor. And uh, we'll see you all afterwards, John. Thank <laughs> you.